Hello everyone and welcome to Book Days. Today's adventure has brought us to Austin, Texas, downtown to the historic Norwood Tower, where we are visiting GFF Architects and we are going to be discovering and exploring the world of architecture, and particularly here in Austin. I'm so excited, let's head on up. The book of the day is Iggy Peck Architect by Andrea Beattie, illustrated by David Roberts. This book is about a little boy named Iggy who has a real talent for building and creativity. Everyone recognizes Iggy's gift, except his second grade teacher, Miss Lilla Greer, who constantly tries to suppress Iggy's in-class creative abilities. It's not until a very eventful field trip that Miss Lilla Greer finally acknowledges Iggy's real gift for architecture. Find this book at your local bookstore or library today. And now it's time for our adventure. We're off to Austin, Texas. Let's go. I am so excited to be here today at GFF Architects in downtown Austin with Zach McLean. Zach, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. He is the Senior Project Coordinator here at GFF, and today we're going to be talking all about architecture. I'm so excited. This is so different from any of our other book episodes uh, featuring STEM and uh, particularly in the engineering side of life. Um, so Zach, can you explain the difference between an architect and an engineer? Sure. Um, it's something that's really easy to get confused. Um, engineers and architects are alike in the sense that we all design and we all problem solve. I would say the main difference is that engineers have a, uh, a specific trade, mm -hmm. whether it be structural, mechanical, electrical, chemical, um, whereas architects are almost a jack of all trades. You know, we work with clients to develop their needs for a project. We also coordinate with our consultants who are also engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we oversee construction. Um, so we wear a lot of different hats. Um, the the old saying goes, uh, engineers know a little or a lot about a little, yeah. and architects know a little bit about a lot. <laughs> yes, definitely. Oh, that's no, that's fantastic because I feel like sometimes the lines get blurred between the architect and the engineer. So I feel sometimes the perception of an architect is it's a one-man job. They go in, they maybe design some plans, uh, maybe they build a few things like in our uh, book today, Iggy builds all kinds of creations, but as an architect, it's really, as you were just telling me earlier, it's, it's a whole team of people that uh, come up with designs and make these projects reality. Can, can you talk a little bit about the structure of GFF? Absolutely. So our, our studio predominantly operates out of studios. Each studio has maybe 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. And within that studio, we have um, a multitude of different structured positions, whether it be um, a project manager or a studio director, all the way down to um, a senior project coordinator or uh, a draftsman. Um, and so, again, it's, it's all very collaborative. Um, you know, we also work with our clients and their teams of people to come up with the project that's going to best serve their needs. So, as we know, kids love to play with Legos, Lincoln Logs, Zach, did you enjoy playing with those as a kid? Absolutely. Uh, I was very into making things, just using whatever was around, and I was a huge Lego fanatic when I was a kid. Um, really anything I could get my hands on to just make something, mm -hmm. um, do something with my hands, and I think that's a really important aspect um, for a kid when you're starting out and you feel a creative spirit, you mm -hmm. know, um, 
to you know garner that Yes. Um, to uh, yeah, continue to develop your skills as a, as a creative. Mm -hmm. What would you say the importance of all those uh, Lego building sessions the kids have to the Magna blocks, things like that? Um, what would you say in relation to that? How important is that in their development? It it is so important, um, and and I would also charge you know that if if you do want to get into a creative field to start now. Um, you know, don't wait for permission. Um, you know, just start developing those skills, and and it, it, you'll find out soon enough if it's something that you're really passionate about. Awesome. Okay, so speaking of creativity, uh, we have so many different things here uh, on the table: models, sketches. Zach, can you tell us about all of these things? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll start with the models. Um, so this is a series of. 3D models. Um, these are all different iterations for a high rise that we were designing here in Austin. And this just shows a little bit of the iterative process that we go through with our clients to figure out the, the right massing for the building, mm -hmm. uh, different ways that we, we might want to see the building come together. Um, and so it's a really helpful tool for us to be able to you know, pick up one of these and, and show it to a client and say, hey, here, hold this in your hands and wow. um, look at the massing. Tell us what you think about the, the building as it currently stands. And, and we can start to have a conversation based on these different iterations. And how do you make these models? Are they? So these were 3D printed I was gonna in, say. Our, in our Dallas shop. <laughs> Very cool. And so these are all just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Wow, so this one has like the grooves here. Um, these are all different. Is this like an outlook here and that one doesn't have it? Yeah, so what you're seeing modeled here is a, a ground level lobby, a parking deck, uh, a sky amenity that mm -hmm. would be, that would branch out over the parking garage, right. and then a full office and residential. Wow. One of the other interesting things about this model is it, it's located in an area called the Capital View Corridor. Okay. And so what that means is that we have to honor a certain uh, easement, mm -hmm. an invisible line basically mm -hmm. in space um, that tells us where we can and cannot build. And it all has to do with keeping views toward uh, the Texas Capitol. Yes. No doubt. I knew that as a kid. I didn't know the term for it, but uh, growing up in Austin, the Capitol is definitely one of our most treasured buildings uh, in this state, uh, probably the most treasured building. Fantastic. Um, so let's talk about some of these prints. How do you design these and yeah. how important are they to this line of work? Yeah, absolutely. So I think to start off, you know, a lot of times our work begins with just a simple sketch. You know, we're, we're just getting out ideas. Um, a lot of times it'll take place in the form of a plan similar to this. And sometimes it's, it's a three dimensional sketch or just a quick concept in a meeting with a client just to you know, talk about, hey, here's what we think will work for the needs of the project. Here's what we would like to see happen. Um, and then we slowly begin to develop that into a more cohesive, concrete plan. Something more like this, which is, you know, a more construction document level. You know, this would be the kind of drawing we would issue to a contractor to say, hey, here's a drawing, go ahead and build this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all throughout that process, we're figuring out the, the basic programmatic elements of the project. So, you know, where does the parking garage go? Where's our leasing office? You know, how are the units arranged? And does that meet the, the client's quota for what they need out of the project? Mm -hmm. You know, where are stairs and elevators located? You know, how are those detailed? All of those little things, um, even site matters, you know, transformers, water lines, electricity, yeah. all those things have to be coordinated. And so, you know, Within the course of months, we've gone from a simple sketch to mm -hmm. something that you could build. And so from this, we talked about the difference between an architect and an engineer. How closely do architects and engineers work together? Very closely, especially on, on our projects. Um, you know, when we do a lot of multifamily architecture mm -hmm. and we work heavily with a structural engineer, uh, mm -hmm. an MEP engineer, that's mechanical electrical plumbing. Yeah. Um, we work with interior designers, um, and a handful of other consultants um, very, very closely um, so that everything on the site is coordinated the way that it should be so that when we go to build, yeah. everything works the way that it should. Wow, okay. So this is, a, this is a rendering that we did for the client 
um, looking in this direction back at the building. Oh, and so cool. okay. these we find are very helpful to give the owner a sensibility for what the building is going to look like. And, um, and we find that it also helps us with our material choices on the building and mm -hmm. having that conversation with the client as well. I really like that the architect piece is about the aesthetics. Um, I guess a little bit more maybe would you say than the, the structural is kind of the engineer uh, side of it, but there's a heavy focus on the aesthetics of the building? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think as an architect, it's really important to understand materiality mm -hmm. and when what is appropriate when. Um, it's also a conversation that we have with our owner. Um, a lot of our, our different clients um, prefer different materials for, for whatever reason. Um, or it, it might have a, uh, it might have something to do with the availability of the materials. Uh, so for instance, um, when COVID-19 happened, we had a few materials such as this wood tone here mm -hmm. um, that we could not get enough of. And so uh, we either had to delay um, how soon that would be delivered on site mm -hmm. or choose a different material. Oh, that's true. I didn't think about that, especially with the shortages nowadays. Man, that could really throw off the entire plan. And uh, speaking of wood, um, I know that your favorite style of architecture is the modern, more Scandinavian. Yes. And I know you have some pictures over there. So can you um, talk to us just a little bit about why this one is your, your favorite? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get these over. So I, I really enjoy Scandinavian architecture for a handful of reasons. Um, I think the, the biggest um, the biggest reason I, I enjoy it is because it responds so heavily to its environment and the landscape. Um, you can see in almost all of these pictures just how um, beautiful and breathtaking the landscapes are in those areas. And the architecture does really well to respond to that, both in views uh, and in material, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so what we see a lot of in Scandinavian architecture is you know large glass windows getting a lot of daylight um, since they don't experience a lot of daylight during the winter months um, and getting a lot of really great views to the beautiful landscape um, they also use you know obviously a lot of glass um, but also a lot of wood which i think is very um, indicative to biomimicry um, so biomimicry is a term um, that means that you know the architecture is mimicking a certain natural process uh, or a material. Yeah. Uh, and so, in this way, you know, Scandinavian architecture, yeah. uh, it it implements a lot of wood tone elements, mm -hmm. um, natural colors, things of that sort um, that really tie back to the landscape surrounding it. This is maybe one of my favorite. That it it literally mimics the. The, uh, the color of the rock. Mm -hmm. That's really gorgeous. Have you ever been to Scandinavia? I would love to go. <laughs> it's, on, it's on my list. <laughs> this is fantastic. So Zach, how did you get into this line of work? I think it was, it was definitely um, a God thing for me. Um, I think there was, a, there was a calling in my heart to create. And, um, and for me, um, that, was, that was the most important thing. Um, I think with anything else, it was um, you know, finding a passion and, and honestly practicing. You know, a lot of times we wanna be uh, good at something, um, but we want it to come easily. Yeah. And I think you know, the trick for anybody, even with something you're passionate about, is to really do the work and to, you know, in this case, you know, sketch, draw, um, you know, make art, do renderings, you know, mm -hmm. um, learn different programs, you know, all those things that make a great designer a great designer. What advice would you have for any kids that are looking to be architects? Definitely um, start creating. Um, you know, don't, again, don't wait for permission, you know, um, use whatever you have, whether it's a, a pencil and a piece of paper or uh, some sticks and yeah. some glue. <laughs> Um, Legos or Legos <laughs> or you know playing in the sand wh whatever it yeah. is but you know just to, to open your mind to new ideas to seeing mm -hmm. the world in a different way you know so much of what we do um, for our clients and for our consultants and for our community is really to tie all of our work together um, and, and take a position in the world you know and, mm -hmm. and to have an opinion about 
our, our community and how we want to impact it. And yeah. so I think starting those skills mm -hmm. and, and really just developing confidence, you know, to, to have a mind of your own and, and to, yeah. um, it's important. To, to think about different ideas and be able to express those ideas. No doubt. Okay, Zach, thank you so much for being here today and showing us so many wonderful and amazing things about the world of architecture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming with us on our adventure today to downtown Austin, Texas. And I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming adventures. We'll see you soon. Bye. Want more book days? Well, the adventure has only begun. Check out these episodes and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming adventures.